three families are about to go back in time. I feel almost like I've been sentenced to five months hard labor. You can have the best intentions of coming out and, and starting a life here, and before you know it, you're bust. It's not quite as charming as it once was, and the Garden of Eden has turned into hell. Fictionalized, mythologized, often romanticized. Now, see the real experience of life on the frontier. Funding for Frontier House is provided by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. Corporate support is made possible by Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, makers of over 400 stone ground whole grain products for every meal of the day. Our all natural products are available at your local grocer or natural foods market. Bob's Red Mill Natural Foods, to your good health. And by Georgia Pacific. Life on the frontier would have been different with GP brands like Quilted Northern Bath Tissue, Brawny Towels, and Dixie Cups and Plates. Georgia Pacific. We make the things that make you feel at home. Major funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. It is early summer in Frontier Valley, where Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress. Oh my God, there's my tomato plant. Gotta get that indoors. In the battle against the elements, our homesteaders are learning that the odds of survival are diminishing day by day. Grab my hammer. Grab my hammer right there. Looks like it was gonna be just a little bit of rain. Bloody all hell's broken loose here. That's a hail, that's just one little melting hail pellet. And they hurt. There's a guy out there, because he's thundering. It's a constant reminder of uh, how insignificant you are, <laughs> how, how little itty bitty you are. And uh, God's country is like a two-edged sword. It's beautiful, but it could also be a hell. seven weeks into their experience, and the three families now have completed cabins, each a 10-minute walk from the other along Frontier Creek. At the top of the valley, newlyweds Nate and Kristen Brooks have been left alone for a week to enjoy a homestead honeymoon. You gonna do the chicken? Now Kristen, a newcomer to the frontier, is waking up to her pioneer life. I didn't really realize anything after the wedding for at least a week. Like, I just was in kind of a daze and trying to adapt to what it was like out here. Oh, God. You just lie there in bed and you think, oh, you got the whole day ahead of you and you got to work so hard and you just don't feel like getting out of bed. It's cold. I'm putting on dirty clothes. It's just so depressing to put on crusty socks. They just crust up. I don't know why, from the sweat or whatever. It's gross. And the shoes bum me out because you have to unlace them all the way, put your foot in, relace them. It's not like you just slip on some shoes and stumble outside to go do something. You have to like get ready, put all your armor on. I always feel this obligation because I feel like I have to cook for Nate. And I have to get it going. That's my part of the deal. And it happens the minute you get out of bed. I've been in here for about hour, 15 minutes, hour and a half. <laughs> and I have created this. Check it out, isn't it beautiful? At least Fluff's gonna get a chance to eat. 
I mean, there's several things I'm not good at, but I should be able to cook pancakes on the frontier, you know? I mean, this is what's pissing me off. Baking powder and baking soda. Who the f knows what these things do? <laughs> it drives me nuts. It sucks. It just totally sucks. It's totally hard out here. Okay, turn it off. From the beginning, the Kloon family has felt they haven't had enough food. So during their recent visit to the local store, they ordered more than twice as much food as the other families. Ooh. Now they have to settle their bill. Peanuts? Hop Sing Yim is Frontier Valley's local merchant. Each family started with a limited amount of credit at his store. Coffee? Nine pounds of bacon. Apricots. Apricots. That's a uh, 15 pound worth of cheese. 15 pounds, pass it on. And that's lard, 25 pounds, very heavy. Pass it on, 25 pounds of lard. This okay. reinforces the theory that you shouldn't order food or go shopping when you're hungry. <laughs> what do you think? We were so hungry when I ordered this food. It's like, ah! <laughs> Not only have the Clunes used up all of their credit, they've put themselves $38 in debt. That's three months' wages to an 1883 farm laborer. Gordon has to get out of debt, so he's decided to sell his team of horses and their foal. OK, let me check the ages first. Although he makes money, it it's a big risk. Their horses could be the Clunes' okay. most valuable asset, vital for transportation, particularly when the snow arrives. The goal for all the families is to thrive as homesteaders and be ready to take on their first winter. But at this rate, even before the snows begin to fall, Hop Singh may own all the livestock and even their cabins. The stakes are high. Nearly two-thirds of the original homesteaders who came out west didn't last the required five years to gain ownership of their land. Montana is littered with their failed claims. I'd like to help you in your trouble. Struggles to the sea. Fifty ways to make you up Eager not to become a failure statistic, the Glens are working on ways to feed themselves. Mark is building a coop to raise chickens. Wily, aren't you? Uh-huh. It's a priority. Yeah. She designed this. Told me how she, she thought she'd want it, so I just built it that way. It's easier that way you absolve yourself of any blame or anything if it's a bad design. Uh, I'm just a worker, you know? I'm just a, a guy doing this. There we go. Yeah. Why? Because I was just uh, wanting to have that Alice in Wonderland effect, you know, a little bitty door, get down, see the swirls okay. on it. Okay, I don't have time for that. That's not going to work, is it? No. That's not going to work. See, what I was thinking you were going to do was lay those slab pieces down and then go back and plank the seams. I'm gonna get a couple of tacks. All day, just to build the floor. Yesterday. That's why I kept saying, you need some help, you need some help. No, 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 no. Don't need no help. Okay. Fine. Love them, go ahead and grab them. Despite the difficulties, at least the chickens now have a home. You're in the chicken business. The Glens have made the choice to raise as many animals as they can in the first year. No, 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 Chester. So in addition to their two dairy cows, two calves, two horses, and 15 chickens, they invest in five sheep and a pig. Y'all can name her, but remember, we're gonna slaughter her. That's Gosh, the plan. She's eating the poop. We felt like it was vital to have animals. 
We felt like it was vital to have a pig that we could slaughter at the uh, beginning of fall and be able to smoke the meat or put it up or uh, preserve it. And we thought it was important to have sheep that we could uh, turn into food if we needed to. All of our livestock is, is very important. Our cows are vital. The butter and milk is a big source. We do some trading within the community of that. Without our livestock, we're dead. There's no way, I don't think any way, a homesteader can survive out here without horses and at least a dairy cow. The Brooks don't agree. They have no horses or cows and instead purchase only 15 chickens and six sheep. Yeah, honestly, I don't get too excited about animals just because I'm not an animal person. So homesteaders sort of have to be animal people because that, that's what you need to do out here. There's nothing else to do except have animals. Little whammy. I like the lambs. I don't like the sheep. Chickens and sheep, at least I see them as the biggest reward for the least amount of work, you know? And not to say we're lazy, but it, I think that's our approach. You have a limited amount of financial resources. And so if I think if you dabble in too many things that are unsuccessful, it, you know, you're kind of sent home packing. Hi. Hello, lamb. Becoming a sheep herder is just one of the ways Kristen is coming to terms with her frontier life. Check out the eyebrows growing in. Woo! Um, oh my god, I just look so ugly! Oh, and it's cold as anything. It's just so many different levels of, of it being hard. It's hard because I'm dirty and my breath right now is atrocious. I always feel greasy. Like, I almost feel like I've got a ring of zits all around my hairline. So it's this, it's this part. I just feel stinky, reeky, greasy, and there's no way to get cute. Like, I love being able to, if you feel nasty for three or four days at home, you just freshen up, put some eyeliner on, and you feel cute. It just makes you want to just scream. I just feel so gross. I just feel ugly and it stinks. Even when I wash it, it's never clean. It has, it's not the grease that's dirty, it's the um, soap residue that never comes out. It's disgusting. <laughs> in the 1880s, people who invested in sheep got lucky. The brutal winter of 1886 killed the majority of cattle in Montana. But sheep, better adapted to harsh winters, survived. By 1900, Montana would emerge as the number one wool-producing state in America. Winter in Montana can last six months when there is little or no forage for animals. Our families realize if their animals are to survive, they have to begin harvesting hay now. Unsure of how much they need, the Glens get advice from the Frontier House experts. We have to harvest the hay that we want. For our own animals? Right. Harvesting hay is getting out there with a the scythe and cutting it and baling it and putting it up for winter feed. Well, there's a lot of green up there. Luckily, we got a big old meadow in front of us, about 20 acres of it. In a moderate winter, a cow or horse might eat a ton of hay. All three families will have to put up hay, but because the Glens invested in so many animals, the news hits them the hardest. When it came to this haying process, I mean, it just blew us away because it seemed so undoable with two people. We had four large animals, two horses and two cows. And it just seemed like, you know, why even start? Because I know I cannot meet that goal. And I hate going into a situation where I know I'm already beat. If we can't feed our animals, we have to get rid of our animals. If we don't have our animals, we're not going to make it through winter anyway. You want to explain to me exactly what's fun about your hands cracking and bleeding while you're holding on to a, a, a tool, swinging it through a bunch of tall hay or swinging it through grass? 
this is just so physically demanding. Um, I don't even know any work that compares with this now. The brooks will need far less hay than the glens, but Nate is harvesting extra with the idea that in winter, hay will become a sought after commodity. In the end, I don't think the glens will be able to get enough hay up to, to keep that number of livestock. I think they'll definitely be in the, in the market for hay or they'll be getting rid of animals. In either case, I feel like we're in a, in a seat to uh, succeed in, in the middle of winter. Either we sell hay or, or we buy animals at a pretty deep discount. On the frontier, one family's loss can be another's gain. But Mark Glenn is determined not to fail. I'm in the homesteader group because I think I've got that fear, that panic, um, possibly even that paranoia that if I don't take advantage of every day from the moment the light comes out until the moment the light goes out, if I don't do everything that I can, this place isn't going to make it. There is a bit of a panic out here. There's a panic to get things done before the weather changes. There's a panic to survive. There's a panic to put food on the table. Panic to make sure we have eggs to eat and the milk to, that's healthy. The clunes do have a reason to worry. In two weeks, their major livestock investment, 36 chickens, have laid only one egg. All right, here we are in front of the new improved Kloon chicken coop. As you can see, we built a really nice enclosure with uh, roosts and nests. We're experiencing great difficulty getting any eggs. So this family's working hard to try to get us some eggs and thus get us some protein. We're working our butts off trying to make that happen, but the chickens don't cooperate. The girls have inspected them to try to find out which ones are egg layers. The clunes are under the impression that the way to tell if a chicken will lay is to inspect its vent, where the egg comes out. Someone has to do it. No, not me. Some homesteaders knew very little about animals. Yes. Connor, come on. Oh, do you want to no. be on the plate? If you do, she'll be my hero. In fact, a common insult that Montana ranchers hurled at the newly arrived homesteaders was to call them honeyockers, which meant chicken chasers. Mm -hmm. Just do it! So you don't want any eggs, Connor? You need eggs. Do you want to keep being skinny or what? Yes. Do it. And then you'll get it over and done with him to be able to wash your hands. How many can you fit? All three. Oh. <laughs> I hate you! Even chickens with unsatisfactory vents will feed the clones one way or the other. Catherine Howard will be executed by the decree of the king. And off with her head. We're, and we're hungry, right, guys? Yeah! <laughs> I get the right leg. Shh, shh, shh. And don't laugh. celebrate and don't laugh. This isn't a funny thing. I don't enjoy this. Hopefully, the Kloon family will have some protein. We've got to be able to feed ourselves. And we've got to just be able to survive. still have one horse and a milk cow that will need hay. But cutting all day in the hot sun gives the body a beating. Uh. Unused to such intense physical effort, Gordon Clune has been feeling dizzy and weak. I gotta have a two hour break. I went to hell. For a week and a half, I tell you, I couldn't pick up anything. I had no energy, my joints ached. I couldn't even freaking walk over to the glens without it being like a real pain and my back was killing me. I can tell that um, my, my waist was getting smaller. I noticed that I was losing weight. I was losing weight after we bought a ton of supplies. We bought everything you could think of that was, that was procurable at that store. Here to see what it is. Suspicious of his homesteader diet, Gordon decides to see how the other men on the frontier are measuring up. God darn. 
<laughs> yeah, so he's a 30 chest. So he's, um, you're, you're, you're fairly slender. You're slender, yeah, no I'm question. Slender, slender. Anyway. Yeah. Do you think you've lost any muscle? No. No, as a matter of fact, I think I've gained some muscle. Uh -huh. Gordon is allowed a modern scale to check his weight. Three months ago, he weighed nearly 180 pounds. Now, he's below 147. I had a 42 chest. I have a 36 chest. I had a 36 waist. I have a 31 waist. I don't know my thighs are half probably the size that they used to be. So I lost a little over 30 and a half pounds. I'm a shadow of what I used to be. All the Frontier men have lost between 25 and 30 pounds. Their waists are slimmer and their shoulders are wider. Remarkably, they now weigh close to the average for men in the 1860s, as found in military records. I'm in the best shape I've been in in 20 years. Float it down the river. But Gordon believes that his weight loss has more sinister implications. I really inspected my diet to try to see what's going on with my diet, because something was vitally missing, and that was protein. Do, do you think the ham and the bacon um, was protein for me? I, I ate it every day. I ate it every morning, I ate it every lunch, I ate it every dinner. And I, I can't tell you what, what the effect was on me. If protein source is a concern and we have milk, drink the milk. You know, I just don't understand why it has to be a protein source from an animal. It's got to be red meat to make it nutrition. That's not true. You can ask any nutritionist. While working in the fields, the clunes uncover an unexpected source of protein. We were making hay and everything, and we got a rattlesnake, as you can see. My dad and everybody ran over. He had a pretty close call of actually getting bitten, but it didn't actually bite him. We're going to um, see if we can actually get the meat out of it and somehow cook it. This is our dinner. Fresh meat. When he wanted to bring it home yesterday and cook it, I'm thinking, I'm not cooking that thing. If he wants to take that home, he's cooking it. There's no way I'm cooking rattlesnake or eating it. And I'm amazed that Anya's able to do this. If the girls need any tips on cooking, I'll tell them from the background. But I don't even want to see it. I just can't handle it. Cook it up. Cook it up. Let's go. Oh, God. That tastes good. The flavor is great. No meat on mine. Not much meat on it, huh? All of you are happy to just have rounds. That's what I'm eating. This is our meal. There sure isn't much to them, though, is there? It's just not enough meat on them. I think making a soup would have been better. You know, boiling. With rattlesnake off the menu, Gordon remains desperate for a change from that pioneer staple, beans. You found me in the um, outhouse, and I'm. It's funny, I'm sick. I ate beans last night, and I'm sicker than a dog today as far as, you know, sick. I mean, I mean, I got, like, diarrhea really bad. If I can get protein, I'm going to get it another way. The beans isn't giving me the weight gain either if I e eat it and it goes through me that quickly. I'm not in the mood to be sick. Not anymore. On Friday the 13th of July, the clunes finally cracked. Breaking the rules they agreed to, they look for solutions in the modern world. A mile outside Frontier Valley, the camera team surprised Adrienne and the children inside a modern home. We're not escaping. We just went out to go trading. It's not an escape, believe me. I'm trading baked goods with the neighbors, and yes, these are people that live in the 21st century, but I'm doing this out of desperation. I have a husband at home who is fading away, obviously, almost every day. He is losing so much weight. The diet that we are on, even since we got our supplies, is not enough to sustain a man. While Adrienne was inside trading her baked goods, the children sat down to watch television. I thought it was pretty dumb how we got blamed for watching because it wasn't even worth watching it. It was just MTV. We watched two minutes of it, and I guess everyone thinks that we watched like an hour of it. Me and Anya are just doing this to save our family. 
because we've been not having a lot of meat and we all, Uncle Gordon especially, is getting really skinny and very unhealthy looking. So we just came out here to try to get something to help our diets, like get some meat or something and trade with people, and that's what we're doing. We got Spirit flavor. Huh? Uh, deer burger. Woo! Doggy. Deer, deer burger. burger. And elk steak. Woo! <sighs> After a taste of the 21st century, not all of the clones want to return to 1883. I kind of wish I was home right now. Kind of wishing that you guys would kick us off. Because if we quit, then everyone's going to be mad. So this way, if you guys kick us off, then no one's going to be mad at us. But it's kind of sad because if we get kicked off, then the whole family's going to get kicked off, and they don't want to get kicked off. But I do. So anyway, Lord, thanks for the house over our head. And most importantly, thanks for this family, this wonderful family who cares and who constantly come out from, from somewhere, wherever it is, they come out and they produce food and they put it on the table. You guys are great. The clunes are feasting on potatoes, carrots, and onions. Today you can buy them 12 months of the year. But in the mountains of Montana in 1883, you would have to wait until late summer to harvest vegetables like these. Elk steak from one family, and we got potatoes, carrots, and onions from another family in trade for our baked goods. Pretty good trade, huh, guys? And more to come. They should have kept walking that day and just got the hell out of here. Because from that day forward, all they've been doing is trying to make it as things as easy as possible on them until they got out of here. It's just funny how badly we all wanted to be in this project. Everyone wanted to be in this project. I mean, 5,000 people wanted to be in this project. And here we are. We begged. We got what we wanted. Now we're here. We got chosen. So I don't know why we'd want to wreck that. We had no choice but to break the rules. You've got to do whatever it takes to figure out how to feed your family, how to survive, how to get your crop in, and how to keep what you got. You just got to do it. And that's the very spirit of what's going on here. And that's, what's, that's the spirit that's coming out. And I, I think we're more on target than we've ever been. For a professional opinion on Gordon's malnutrition, Dr. Ace Walker, a consulting physician with the U.S. Marine Corps, pays the clunes a visit. Well, hello. Hi, Dr. Walker. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you. Particularly for me, I had a, a real problem where I landed up having like frozen muscles, or for not joints, not muscles, joints. The worst part of it was. After the making his assessment, AIDS. Ace thinks he knows what was really ailing God. Gordon. How and, much uh, water are you drinking? Um, I'm drink. You know, we have filtered water. I'm, I'm drinking water. You know, I'm definitely drinking water. And the symptoms you described to me sound more like dehydration, um, because that can affect your your fluid balance as well as your electrolytes, and those will affect how your muscles function mm -hmm. and cause you weakness. When I came in to, to, to visit Gordon, I was uh, surprised at how fit he was. The comment that I made to him is that he was looking lean and mean. My impression of him when he first came into the project is that he was in the overweight category, which a third of the people in this country probably are. Then he has this dramatic change as he's burning up these calories, and to him, in his mind, his, his body is, has changed so drastically that he is concerned about the nutrition, and he could become fixated on that very easily. I think now, he's, by his measurements, he is uh, in the healthy, lean category. The clunes promise to stop dealing with modern neighbors. Instead, they trade with the Brooks, who bring a valuable supply of chopped firewood. Whoa, look at that for a trailer load. Adrian, you'll need us wood no more. No. We'll help you bring some in, Adrian. Because Nate and Kristen have no dairy cow, they want milk and Adrian's baked goods made with butter. Scones, raisin oh, scones. Yeah. Apple pie. Oh, it's beautiful. Peach pie. Wow. And we got breads here. These are, they're all oatmeal. 
We'll get a good good bar to here. I hate anything Two to do with it, It's like money. the floor of the stock market. It's Maybe we get, should let like Gordon and Nate deal with it. Gordon? The neat part about this, I think, is that we all need each other. Yeah. So how much is the peach pie? <clears throat> all right. Peach pie, That's I would say, what I'm yeah, at. 65 cents. 65 cents? I didn't care what the price was. <laughs> the, 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 peach the, peach, the peach pie is coming home. <laughs> The families can also trade with Hop Sing Yin Mercantile. The actual store that existed in this area in the 1880s not only served homesteaders, but workers from nearby mining operations. At one point, there were over 500 miners in need of goods and services. So the families are invited to sell butter, eggs, and baked goods to the miners via Hop Sing store. The butter and egg business, as it was known in 1883, was run by women and children and was one of the most important domestic businesses on the frontier. Mom, two eggs. Even the clunes chickens are starting to lay enough eggs to sell. When we first got the chickens, we, I guess we didn't really know that much about them and we had like 35 of them or something. We definitely needed a lot more food to begin with. That was basically our only main problem. We were getting like one egg a day. I had to like totally turn it around and stuff. Now I have six dozen. A small income begins to brighten things up at the Glens and the Clunes. 637 for the eggs. And when we add it all up together, $8.99. That's pretty good, huh? Not wanting to miss out on the booming dairy business, the Brooks acquire Glowbug and Rachel, milk goats. They are hoping to have a new product to sell in the valley, goat's cheese. To make the cheese, Kristen adds vinegar to hot goat's milk. To help the curdling process, she also tries to add baking soda. I'm gonna add a little baking soda directly to this stuff. Whoa, total science experiment. Whoa! <laughs> huh, wonder if that was a good idea. Oh, shit. <laughs> Goat cheese gone bad. Oh, man. It might be all right, because all that's gonna be curds, which is good. There's no record of Chev being a staple of the pioneer diet, but it was small entrepreneurial efforts that often made the difference between success and failure on the homestead. Isn't that cool? Oh, that's perfect, though. It's not it doesn't vinegary. taste like vinegar. And that's exactly how I could sell it. So I, I could just wrap that up right now and bring it to Adrian. In spring boxes built into the icy waters of Frontier Creek, the families can keep their dairy products cool until they're ready to sell. But the income from butter and eggs is still no guarantee that anyone will survive the winter. We have high odds of failure simply because we have livestock. And I can take those odds because I know in my heart that we have done everything authentic, you know, instead of succeeding and going in outside the like perimeters. Right. Succeeding by cheating or faking their way through it. I think the clunes wouldn't have made it through the winter, no. They're about out of money. They have no animals. How are they gonna get to the store in the middle of winter? I can tell you this, they haven't changed and they haven't grown from this experience at all. 30% of the people actually made it. That means one of these families. I mean, we've all done the math. You know, one family's gonna make it, two are gonna fail. I pictured getting along more. I pictured that would all just be this great, happy community that bonded. And, and in actuality, there's a lot of funny um, survival stuff that goes on. I think just because everything is so much more primal and so much more, um, it's like your kids or your food supply, things are just like really real and people turn into animals when it's those types of situations. It's actually interesting because it's good that it happened this way because it's probably what it really was like in 1883. <laughs> Karen is determined to have more money going into winter, so she strikes a deal with Hop Singh, washing miners' laundry. The money to do laundry is, is really very good. I get 20 cents a pound, 
it's honest work. It's good work. It's probably considered um, lowly work by some of my more blue blood lady friends. This is what keeps us in a positive balance at the store. On the frontier, cleanliness is relative. You know, if I can make money at it, I'll do it. As long as it's honest, good work. And I'm not gonna do anything illegal or immoral. Hang on, I'll be right back, okay? Not everyone in Frontier Valley shares Karen's scruples. Gordon's got some things up his sleeve that maybe, maybe we'll get some income from. That'll be fun. At the beginning of the project, each family was allowed to bring one period object. While others brought small items, like a pipe and bolts of cloth, Gordon Clune had his family yeah, company custom design oh, a copper still. The farming alone is, I knew it's not gonna pay for it. You know, you have to augment it with some other business. The still is a very worthwhile activity. In 1883, I'd say this would be worth more money than the 160 acres. Meanwhile, the Clune children have been dispatched to pick local choke cherries. If boiled into a mash and allowed to ferment, the sugar in the cherries turns into alcohol. Gather up the pots and the old tin can, the mash, the corn, the barley, and the bran. Run like the devil from the excise man. Keep the smoke from rising barney. The Clunes can't afford a liquor license, so Gordon is breaking the law. Many original homesteaders took this same risk. In 1883, the government seized nearly 400 stills, more than one a day. But for those who got away with it, illicit alcohol made many rich. I think it's, it's morally right to do it, even though it might be against the law. Eventually, at all the right alcoholic vapor, if you got the right temperature, will come up here and start its descent. And that's the alcohol that we want. Whew. That actually feels quite good. If I could have designed it in such a way where the spout comes right here, this, this, this would be living in, in, Mon in Montana. <laughs> it's high summer now, and the hard work is beginning to pay off. Everyone is eating well and making money. I would really like my mother to come out here and, and see what we've done. Just kind of give her an idea that her oldest boy wasn't exactly the loser that she may have thought. This is our home. We've made this a wonderful little Garden of Eden. We're comfortable here. We feel very safe here. We've got routines and it works here. But Montana always has a surprise in store. Nearby, an unforeseen plague is about to descend. Ken Davenport is a local cattle rancher who plans to drive his cows into Frontier Valley. We've got 222 pair, that's a count of calves a pair, and we're gonna drive them from here up over the homesteaders' land fairly soon, and I think it's important that the homesteaders know we're coming because it is really destructive. They'll eat the gardens and they'll mess up the yards and they'll eat the hay and hay that these homesteaders are planning to cut this summer. The law of open range was and still is on the rancher's side. If the families don't want cows, it's up to them to fence them out. I'm going to write them a letter and tell them in the best uh, manner that I know how urgent it is that they get ready for the cows to come through. Dear Glenn family, I shall be driving 200 head of cattle near your homestead. Under the Montana law of open range, both in 1883 and today, it falls upon you to fence them out should you not wish them upon your property. Cordially, Ken Davenport. It doesn't seem fair. Now we gotta go fence everything off just because he wants to put his cattle in here, if it's our land anyway to begin with. 160 acres. Cordially, Ken Davenport. So, <laughs> he's gonna drive them right through here and let them eat all our crops and our, our things and how fun it is.
The date for the cattle drive is set for August 1st, just over one week away. I'm just really concerned about the cow situation and coming in in time frames and, and getting it done before. Because once the fence is in, I'll feel a lot better about the situation. It's got to be this uh, thing, this man wanting to be godlike, you know, as much as possible. You know, man has that desire and fencing off and controlling his earth, his space. It was a wake-up call for me. I had wandered around here and did my chores and things like that, but really wondered where my place was. How, how was the man supposed to fit into this picture? Karen did the laundry, and uh, uh, Logan takes care of the chickens, Aaron takes care of the milking. I really had no direction until then, and then I understood what my place was. Barbed wire, invented in the U.S. in 1868, revolutionized agriculture. Each year in the 1880s, enough wire was strung up to reach the moon and back. We're running out of time for people from Nashville, Boston, and LA to put up, you know, uh, let's see, what's mine? 4,050 feet of barbed wire. I think the position of the homesteader is you're definitely in a reactionary position, both in terms of your physical environment, all the weather changes, but also just other people, other you know cattle people that come through. When the open range starts, you can stand on the other side of this barbed wire. <laughs> just laugh at the cows. We're in business. At the Glen homestead, the fence is ready, and the whole family is making a last-ditch effort to harvest hay. The cows are due in a couple of days, and when they arrive, they may strip the Glen's hay meadows bare. We've got this huge haystack, and I know it probably weighs nothing. And we've got to get four tons, and it's frustrating, because I know there is no way we can meet that goal. I had a feeling of despair. I did feel like it was too little, too late. I was not prepared. I was not going to be successful. I would not make it through the first winter. Hardly surprising, the stress shows up in Mark and Karen's relationship. We were having a little team meeting about how we all have to um, work together and get along and, and show each other respect. And Mark said he didn't have to listen to this. And I said, everyone has to listen to this. And he left. He, he said he did not have to be counted in with an eight and a 12 year old. And that's the biggest problem that we have is that he doesn't think that um, anything applies to him, that he should be the boss, that he has earned this because I don't know why he's the man. I don't know what he thinks. I'm starting to realize some things about my marriage, that there are some things that I just can't fix about it. There are some things I can't change about the personalities of the people in this family. I'm not sure anymore that I've given 150% and getting nothing back, but uh, ridicule or something, I don't know if it's worth it for me anymore. Before the homesteaders came, the cattle barons had the rangelands of the west to themselves. But the new settlers began to fence the land. The two groups clashed, and the resulting fights were often violent. Keep on moving. Hey, guys, keep going that way. Go ahead. That way. The dwellings are up there. 
Our families are getting their own taste of the range wars. And just like the original pioneers, they pray that their fences will hold. It'll hold. It's sure and true. It'll hold. Yeah, those are real cows, Logan. Not these domesticated jerseys we've got that answer to their names. These are the bad boys. Logan, those are ugly. Golly, I didn't know they'd sweat that fence that close, though. This fence is a, one of those reminders, too, that every time you walk by, you say, I did that. The Glens don't get much time to enjoy Mark's achievement. The fence keeps the cows at bay, but the Glens own sheep sabotage their defenses. They break into their garden and begin to devour their vegetables. Hey, quit yelling at me! I got him up into the field. Yeah, I can see up into uh, the you know garden. What? You know what? You don't take responsibility for him. Hey, <laughs> quit crying. You're in the wrong. I didn't even let him out. They got out. I'm sorry you're talking with your mouth full. Because I haven't had any lunch. I'm starving to death because you don't whore, you horse. I'm starving. Horse. Gordon, are you protein deficient? What's your problem? I can't watch the sheep all the time. I just... You don't watch the sheep all the time, you damn poor pitiful victim. You, you heard them once or twice, and all of a sudden you do it oh. all the time. So quit your whining. It's not attractive. What is the difference between you right now and Gordon Clune? Nothing. What is the difference between you and Gordon Clune? Nothing. Because I don't tell Always anybody what to run do your in mouth this house. and blame things on everybody control, else because you are things. overworked and That's you do very everything. Bad. That's, it's just quit playing the victim. Tired of it. The real Gordon Clune is about to celebrate. His first batch of moonshine is nearly ready. This is spent mash. I wanted to see if the chickens would like it. And I think they like it. They're loving it. They might get a little tipsy, but you know, it's Friday night. I think they deserve a break. This is what we got. It's happening. I'm not worried about my children seeing me do this. In fact, I'm, I'm encouraging them to participate with me in any way, because again, it's knowledge and it's a good knowledge. You know, it's very scientific doing this. It's fabulous, and I'd rather them learn the the real important responsibilities with alcohol, even how to make it, what 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 is it, what to come from, and what it's a duty when you drink it. So they'll be better responsible um, in 1883 or 2001. Who turned out the lights? With the moon shining going on down at the clunes. I said that I was a bit disappointed that the kids were participating, and, and I don't think children involved making alcohol is what I would want to see. I try to keep in mind what my preacher might be thinking and what my Sunday school class might be seeing. When I go back to Tennessee, I'll be able to hold my head high and know that we did things morally right, ethically right, legally right, and by our Christian faith right. I do believe that for some reason Karen thinks this is a competition. Competition between one family and another. It's not. It's family versus nature. It's family versus the elements. It's family versus what mother nature. I mean, it's that's that's the competition. It isn't anything to do with them, but they're preoccupied with fair play. Karen basically just spews a lot of foul things and a lot of accusation things out of her mouth. Kind of like we had diarrhea here when we got here for the first four weeks. She's pretty much had diarrhea of the mouth ever since she's been here, as far as I'm concerned. So I avoid her as much as possible. If I were really 1883 and the neighbors were fighting and we never saw anybody and we didn't want to anyway and I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to stay out here. You know, I left my whole family and I came out to marry Nate and that's all good and romantic. But once you're out here, the, it's not as romantic anymore. I'd probably be saying, oh, what did I do? And then feeling really bad that I felt that way because you're not supposed to feel that way when you first get married. I think I'd want to go home and I'd feel obliged to stay because 
you gotta put in those five years. But I don't think it'd be very fun. Buying into Gordon's scheme, Hop Singh agrees to market his moonshine as a tonic. How about let's try for 50 cents? You should give me the bottle, I'll fill it for you. Okay, that's right. a deal. Good. In the case of Gordon Clune, crime pays. His first deal has earned his family $25, the equivalent of two months' wages as a farm laborer. Gather up the pots and the old tin cans, the mash, the corn, the barley, and the bran. Run like the devil from the excise man. He's a surprising party. Ooh, doggy. Sometimes the wolf at the door is a good thing to make you all bond together and work really hard and, and develop good worth ec ethics. And this, uh, this project to me provided the, well there really is wolves at the door, bears at the door, God knows what other kind of animals at the door, but it provided for me an opportunity for my kids and us as a family to have it tough, to have it poor, to have it where um, it's, it's us together is going to make the difference for us to succeed and put food on the table. I'm afraid the only thing that I've realized out here as far as our relationship was that, you know, I let somebody else call the shots. I've got a 50-50 say in it too, and, and I, I'm going to have to pretty much go my own way if it's together or without her, but I'm going to have to go my own way. I don't have a job when I go back home. My, my relationship or marriage is probably over with. So who's lost more out here? Me. Who's gotten more out of this than anybody else? I think I have. I think I, I've found me, and I think that's even more valuable than, than anything that I've, I've lost. I found a guy willing to work for something that he believes in, and this may be the first thing I've ever believed in outside of my daughter. This may be the first thing I've ever truly believed in because I detached, and I really actually thought I was in 1883. I'm sorry, I just did. And I really believed that if I worked really hard this summer, I could get through the winter, we could. But I'd like to be able to go out of here with someone saying, you know, you might have been able to make it through the winter. There's no way of telling how long you can make it out here, but you might have been able to do it. 